Okay, I decided to preach on the topic of hell today. So we're talking about hell. It's not a pleasant topic, but um, I, th I think it's good to, to learn about hell and to know about it. Uh, obviously, from an unbeliever's perspective, to get saved. But even from a believer's perspective, to have the right um, like perspective, on, or the right teaching on it, because there's a lot of false teachings out there about hell. So I just wanted to mention six of them today. Um, so there's six I need to go through. So uh, number one is hell. Hell is a literal place of fire. It's a literal place of fire in the center of the earth. So how do we know it's in the center of the earth? Well, because every time, a lot of the times in the Bible when, when it mentions hell and it talks about hell, it's always down, it's always low. It's always, you know, in uh, one, one verse says the heart of the earth. We'll just look at those real quick. But in Deuteronomy 32, uh, 22, this is the first mention of hell in the Bible. It says here, For a fire is kindled in mine anger, and shall burn unto the lowest hell, and shall consume the earth with her increase, and set on fire the foundations of the mountains. So we live on a, you know, I believe a round earth. I know there's an argument out there of whether the earth is flat or whether the earth is round. I personally believe it's round. I'm not convinced yet that the earth is flat. So we live on a round, spherical type earth. If hell is low, if hell is beneath, if you go to the lowest hell, it has to be in the center of the earth. And it's interesting that even science, you know, nobody knows what's in the center of the earth, but, you know, molten lava comes out of volcanoes, and science says that the center of the earth is just this molten lava and fire. So it's just funny that even the, the scientific community community admits that in there it's it's hot and it's and it's dark just like the bible describes it uh let's go to psalm 55 15 we'll just look at a couple of verses quick it says let death seize upon them and let them go down quick into hell for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them as for me i will call upon god and the lord shall save me uh Let's have a look at Ezekiel here, Ezekiel 31.16. says here in Ezekiel, I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend, that descend into the pit. So again, down, down and descend. And all the trees of Eden and the choice and best of Lebanon, all that drink water shall be comforted in the nether parts of the earth. They also went down into hell with them, unto them that be slain with the sword, and they that were his arm that dwelt under his shadow in the midst of the heathen. So the Old Testament verses are sometimes prophetical, so you've got, you know, it mixes between a, a, a physical scenario and then a spiritual. Um, but we see there that hell is always referred to as uh, going down. I'll just show you one from the New Testament as well quickly. In Matthew 11. This is uh, Jesus here condemning the cities, and it says, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For of the mighty works which have been done in thee, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. So hell is, I believe, in the center of the earth. So if you were to go down into the lower parts of the earth, into the center of our spherical world, you would reach hell. But nobody knows what's down there because nobody can drill that far. You know, I heard an analogy once that the, on an apple, they, they say that the, the skin of the apple is thicker than the crust of the earth, which is the crust is the, the earth that we live on. So the, the earth is really big and it's really deep and nobody has even been able to, I think, drill through even the crust, let alone get down to the next layer below there. So earth is, uh, hell is in, to, in the center of the earth. Let's go to Mark 9. Verse 43. So hell is a, is a literal place because a lot of people will say, oh, no, hell is not literal. It's just this you know, emotional burning when you're separated from God. Or, you know, they'll say, oh, you know, hell is on earth. And they'll say, you know, when you're going through hard times and, you know, and everything's going bad for you, that's hell. No, no that's not hell because, it's in, first of all, it's in the center of the earth and, and it's a place of fire. Um, look at what uh, Jesus says here in Mark 9. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. 
It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So you see, this is a fire in hell that burns but does not consume, just like the, the burning bush where, where God appeared unto Moses and the bush was alight, but the bush was not consumed. It's almost like the same fire is in hell where it burns and you have a conscious punishment, but it doesn't consume you because the worms in hell don't, aren't consumed and die. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. So when you read a passage like this, and I usually will take somebody to this passage when they say they don't believe in hell, because if, if hell did not exist, if hell was not a literal place, why would Jesus be warning about it? Why would Jesus be saying, you know, it, it's better that you cut off a hand, it's better that you pluck out an eye, it's better that you cut off a leg than go to this place if it doesn't even exist. So that doesn't make sense. If hell is not a literal place, why would Jesus so sternly warn against it? And this is not the only place. And you know, I, I've, I've, I've read and quoted this passage so many times that sometimes I just read over it, I don't really realize what it's saying because it's pretty gruesome. Can you imagine ripping your eye out? I mean, we hear the word pluck and we think like plucking a fruit off a tree, like it just like comes off really easily. <laughs> but if you pluck your eye out, I mean, can you imagine like just tearing your eye out? And, and, but that being better than going to hell. And you know, the, the, the cutting off your foot, where was that? That was, um, was that the first one? No, hand offend thee. Foot 45, and if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. You know, when I read that verse, it reminds me of that movie, um, that movie Saw. I don't know if you guys see, saw that movie, but it's, it's, I remember watching that first one ages ago and it was so disgusting because he's like in a room or whatever and then it's like some uh, like torture chamber and he's like chained. And I, can't remember, I can't remember the whole plot of the movie, but basically the, the movie culminates to the end where he has to decide, do I saw my leg off to get, to, 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 to get rid of this chain and climb to, to freedom or do I stay in that room and continue to be tortured? Uh, something like that. And it just reminds me that, you know, at the end of the movie, he decides that it is worth it. That it is worth it. He gets that saw. That's why the movie's called Saw. And he starts hacking his leg off. And then he cuts his foot off. And then he's like climbing to the door. Because he realized, it's like this verse says, if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. And if you watch that, it's... it's I don't think you actually see him cutting his leg off, but just the, the thought of it, him soaring it off. But you know, that's the sort of imagery that God is using to say, don't go to hell. You know, that hell is so bad that you would rather saw your leg off and climb to life maimed than stay in that room um, having two feet and, and, and be cast into hell. So why would, why would Christ even warn about it if it didn't exist? Uh, look at what it says here in Matthew 26. Uh, it says here, the Son of Man goeth as it is written, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. So talking about Judas here, you know, betraying the Son of Man, and obviously I don't believe Judas was saved, so he went to hell. But we can take this principle here that it's almost like the Bible's telling us here, hey, if you live and you die and go to hell, it, it would be better that you were not even born. That's how bad hell is. And you know, you know, sometimes people will, when you're out soul winning, like people will joke about hell and they'll say like, oh, you know, I don't mind going to hell. You know, I don't care whether I go to hell or not. It's because they don't, they don't realize what hell is like. Because if they honestly understood what hell was like, they wouldn't say things like that. Nobody would want to go to hell. Why would you want to go to a place of fire and torment forever and ever and ever? You wouldn't. It's because they just don't believe that hell is truly what Jesus Christ um, says it is. So the Bible tells us here, hey, it's, it's better that you were not even born than to live a prosperous life and then die and go to hell. So, you know, obviously two applications we can get from the fact that, that hell is a real place, that, you know, it's good that we're, we're saved here, you know, so people that aren't saved need to get saved because if they're not, then this is what awaits them. Um, but also for us as believers, we, it should motivate us, right? 
we need to be reminded that hell is real. Hell is the reason why people need to hear the gospel, people need to hear about Jesus Christ, and that ought to motivate us to get the gospel out there so that we know at least this suburb and this area has been reached with the gospel. So, you know, soul winning is not a game. It's not something that we're playing here. What, what we do Saturdays and Sundays does make a difference. You know what I mean? So um, we need to all be involved and... Uh, hell is, is one uh, reason that should motivate us to uh, do more soul winning. Or when we go soul winning, we do our best, you know, to talk to people and do our best to um, explain to people um, about hell and about how to be saved. So number one, hell is a literal place of fire in the center of the earth. And it's a, and it's a terrible place. All right, number two, hell, hell, let's just say again. You know, hell is God's righteous judgment. It's not, it's not Satan's headquarters. You know, because a lot of people have this idea that, you know, Satan is like the God of hell. He's like the anti-God that is reigning and ruling in hell and God reigns and rules in heaven. So no, the, the God of the Bible is not the God of Greek mythology where you've got, you know, is it Hades in hell and then you've got Zeus in heaven and they're, they're constantly enemies and they're equal footing. No, Satan is a created creature of God and one day he'll be cast to hell. So, he, so it's not that Satan is reigning in hell. Satan is not the God of hell. And it was interesting that um, Brother Kevin, I saw him uh, uh, comment on a, on a Facebook post saying, you know, when people say, oh, you know, they'll say like the NIV is straight out of the pits of hell. Or they'll say like, oh, this doctrine is out of the pits of hell. And Kevin commented saying, you know, that doesn't make sense to me because hell is the place where God judges righteously and punishes sin. It's not Satan's headquarters where he's like sending out his minions from there. Do you know what I mean? So nothing comes out of the pits of hell. Things go to get punished in the pits of hell. Do you know what I mean? So this, this saying doesn't make sense because we have this idea that there's like these hellish minions that are like coming out of hell that Satan is sending. No, no, it doesn't, I don't think it works that way. So out of the pits of hell um, doesn't make sense in, in that sense where it's like Satan's minions being sent. I guess you could say out of the pits of hell, meaning things get sent there to be punished and there, there are evil things in that place. Um, and the thing is, the reason why something can't come out of the pits of hell because only Jesus has the keys of death and hell. So things can, only, can, things can only come out of hell if Jesus allows it, to come out of, allows it to come out of hell. Look at what it says here in Revelation 1.18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forever, forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. I wanted to show you this verse just in light of that, Matthew 16, 18. Because, you know, this is, this is a verse that I think maybe I've misunderstood, and I've just, I was just rethinking this. I just wanted to share this thought with you. But, you know, we, we look at this verse when we talk about church, and we say in verse 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let me just read a, a bit further up here for you, just to get it in context. Verse 13, When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah. Or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now I just want you to keep that verse in, in, in mind um, when we read the next couple of verses. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So what is the it referring to? The fact that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he says, you know, it's not, flesh and blood didn't reveal it to you, Simon, but my Father in heaven, the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the Christ. And then it says here in verse 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So a lot of people, especially the Catholics, try and take this verse to say that Peter is the rock on which the church is built. But another way that you can understand this passage is the rock is Christ. The fact that thou art Christ, the son of the living God, that's the rock that Jesus Christ is going to build his church on. So he's going to build it 
on himself. And that's what the truth is. That's what the, the church is built on. And look in verse 19, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, you know how we were talking about, you know, things coming out of the pit of hell. And, you know, I, I think sometimes we, we may misunderstand this verse, verse 18, where it says, And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we think that, you know, well, the church is going to storm the gates of hell because you've got the armies of hell and then you've got the armies of God. And we, there's this fight between hell and between um, us. But when you think about it, how does that make sense? Why would we storm the gates of hell? Because why would we, why would we be like running and charging into hell because isn't hell the place where god sends people to get punished and then the gates you know they say the gates are defensive right so if hell has gates why are believers charging into hell you know it doesn't make sense right so i was just thinking about this verse and i was thinking it says on this upon this rock i will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it i think i've always understood this verse as the it being the church because you're saying the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church but what if, what if it's the it is the rock? And it's saying, you know, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against the rock. Why? Because Jesus Christ went to hell, right? And he, and he paid for our sins and he got the keys of death and hell and it's saying the gates couldn't keep him in because he can open those gates and get out. So I'm just wondering whether that's another explanation to that verse because it makes more sense to me that, you know, the it is referring to the rock. And the fact that Jesus Christ cannot be kept in hell, but if somebody goes to hell, they can't get out because nothing else can get past those gates. Only Jesus Christ can let somebody out of those gates. But Jesus Christ in Revelation 1.18 has the, the keys of death and of hell, so the gates of hell won't re prevail against it, the rock. Um, <clears throat> and that's how we know we have hope from hell because he owns um, the keys. And I just thought it was interesting that it talks about the gates of hell not prevailing against it, which, which could be the rock. And then verse 19 talks about more keys. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So not only does Jesus have the keys of death and of hell, but he also has the keys of the kingdom of heaven because he's the owner of all those places. So hell is God's righteous judgment. It's not Satan's headquarters. So another verse um, that I thought about in Matthew 23 where we get this idea of like of these uh, the hell's minions. Um, it says here in uh, Matthew 23, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. So just keep that in mind. And then it's in verse 15, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte or a convert, and when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. So I was just thinking, when I was thinking about this whole hell's minions and everything, I thought of this verse and I'm thinking, what about the child of hell in Matthew 23? But then is it like a, a hell's minions child of hell? Or is it just saying that in verse 14, you for a pretense make long prayer, therefore you shall receive the greater condemnation, the greater damnation. So they're a child of hell in the sense that they're going to be condemned to hell. And it's saying that you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he's made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourself. Meaning that they, they create this convert, and now he's even, he's even worthy of twofold the damnation that they're worthy of. Not that they are somehow sent from hell, um, and are one of, um, you know, it's meaning from hell. Anyway, just, just a thought there, just to, to be consistent with um, this whole idea that hell is not uh, Satan's headquarters. Um, and another verse I just wanted to show you in regard to this topic as well. Um, there's, there's, one, there's one thing I can't explain yet. Maybe you guys can in, in the context of, of this understanding. But, you know, the beast in Revelation 17 comes out of the bottomless pit. But I'm not 100% sure what that beast is yet. So maybe, Kevin, you might know. But I just wanted to show you this verse in Revelation 9 because in Revelation 9 we do see um, creatures coming out of hell, right? So this idea of uh, these hell's minions, right? But look at what these creatures do. It says, And the fifth angel sounded, And I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. 
So, you know, I guess I, I would say that that's the key given from Jesus Christ to this angel. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. foreheads. So this is one of the judgments of God in uh, Revelation. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And it goes on to, to describe these, uh, these creatures that come out of the bottomless pit, which we believe is, uh, is, is hell. But the point I just want to make here just supports that point that you know, hell is God's judgment. It's not Satan's headquarters. Satan is not sending out these minions from hell. Who is? God sent them out. right? So God opened up hell and allowed the creatures from hell to come onto the earth to torment the men on the earth as a punishment. And it's almost like there's a period here where on earth it's like hell, where people want to die. Look at what it says here. It says, And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. That's what hell is going to be like. Hell is going to be a place where people want to die, where they want it to be over. They want it to stop, but it won't. It just goes on forever and ever and ever. Men shall seek death and shall not find it. They'll desire to die, but death will flee from them. So I just thought it was interesting there that these, these creatures coming out of hell are not sent by Satan, but these creatures coming out from hell are sent by God and are actually a judgment of God on unbelievers because Satan Satan has not even gone to hell yet um, I just want to show you this verse in Matthew 25 41 um, the story of the king dividing the sheep from the goats he says here in verse 41 then shall he say also unto them on the left hand depart from me ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels so you see, hell is not only a place where unbelievers are punished, but it was originally created to punish Satan and his demons. So Satan does not rule in hell because he's also going to be going there to be punished as well. Um, it's not a, a place that he rules from. Isaiah 14. This is a, a parable out about the, the king of Babylon. Um, that we can apply to Satan. It says here in Isaiah 14, 9, Hell from beneath, so again, hell is beneath us in the centre of the earth, is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee and the worm cover, worms cover thee. So the people in hell are seeing Satan cast into hell and thinking, you've become like one of us? Like you've, you've come to hell as well to be punished? And isn't it funny how it says thy pomp, so the, the pride of Satan is brought down to the grave and the noise of thy vials. So it shows here that Satan is, a, is this musical creature, isn't he? Um, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? So the reason why we believe that this passage is not just talking about a physical person, but it's actually talking about Satan as well, is because no man has fallen from heaven. So it talks about here something falling from heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the, nation, weaken the nations? For thou said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. 
They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake the kingdoms? So Satan has not even yet gone to hell. One day he's going to be cast out of heaven. He hasn't even been cast out of heaven yet. That happens, I believe, later. Um, just before the start of the tribulation, there's a war in heaven and then basically Satan is cast to the earth and then that's what um, begins the tribulation. But um, So Satan has not yet gone to hell. Satan is, will be cast into hell and, the, and hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. Um, and again, we'll just read here in Revelation 20. This is where we actually read where Satan is cast into hell. It says here in Revelation 20, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. So then he... Um, Uh, where is it here? Verse 7. We see here, When the thousand years are expired, so after the millennial reign, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. And here we go. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So we read here in Revelation 20 where Satan is bound and cast into hell for a thousand years in the bottomless pit in the center of the earth. And then later on, he is loosed from his prison to deceive the nations and then he is cast into outer darkness into the lake of fire which I believe is also called hell. We'll get to that in a second. So Satan, again, is not reigning in hell. He one day will be cast into hell. And then we read this here. So number one, hell is a literal place. Number two, hell is God's righteous judgment. Number three, hell is an eternal punishment. It's not this temporary chastisement. And this is what the Muslims believe hell is. The Muslims believe there is an eternal hell that unbelievers go to, but for the believer, hell is also a temporary chastisement, meaning you go to hell to pay off your sins, kind of like this idea of purgatory, where you go there, you burn off your sins, and then eventually you'll go to heaven. Uh, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that hell is an eternal place, um, and there is no out of hell. There is no temporarily going to hell in the Bible. But I just wanted to show you um, just how we can support this doctrine of uh, hell being eternal. And, and the first one is just here in Revelation 20 and in Revelation 19. Because <clears throat> in Revelation 19, we read about the beast and the false prophet being cast into the lake of fire. It says here in verse 20, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, and which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So we see here um, that, the, that the beast and the false prophet are cast into the lake of fire, right? And then in Revelation 20, we see here where Satan is cast into hell in the center of the universe. Oh, sorry, in, this, in, in the center of the earth, not the center of the universe, um, we, which could be the same thing, but I won't, won't go there. So the, the center of the earth, he's bound for a thousand years, and remember he's loosed out of his prison in verse 7, and then he goes to deceive the nations, and then in verse 10, it says here that the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So here in Revelation 20 verse 10, the beast and the false prophet have already been in the, in the lake of fire for a thousand years. And then Satan joins them in the lake of fire and it says here, and they shall be tormented day and night 
forever and ever. So we see here that hell is an eternal place where people are tormented day and night forever and ever. Why? Because the beast and the false prophet are men. Because somebody might say, well, Satan is an angel, right? So Satan is not eternally destroyed like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. But we see here that the beast and the false prophet are there and they are being tormented day and night forever and ever. So these two people are men and they are not being eternally destroyed. Um, what do they call it? Uh, yeah, annihilation. So they are not annihilated. They are there consciously being punished and punished. I would say the most uh, clear verse on everlasting um, punishment for hell is Matthew 25. Well, the Bible says here in Matthew 25, it says here in verse 46, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Because people that believe in annihilation, how can it be an everlasting punishment if you're annihilated? Because then your punishment is just instant, isn't it? But if you're punished forever and ever, day and night forever and ever, then it is an, it is, it's an eternal punishment. It's not um, you're annihilated and then you don't feel it anymore. John 3.36, we see here, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Again, you can take from that to say, how does the, God, how does the wrath of God abide on you if you no longer exist? If you're annihilated and once you go to hell, you no longer exist, there's no conscious punishment, how does the wrath of God abide on you? Well, the Bible says it contrasts here everlasting life with the wrath of God abiding on you because hell is eternal. We saw that from Revelation and from Matthew. Um, look at this verse here in Daniel. It says here in verse 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at, thy, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So there's, there's a verse that supports um, the tribulation being before the rapture, because if we're delivered during this time of trouble, then obviously we're going through it. Uh, it says, everyone that shall be found written in the book, and many of them that sleep in the dust, here's the resurrection, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, so there's salvation, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So it's contempt or hatred or the, the wrath of God that lasts forever. So that sort of lines up with John 3.36 where the wrath of God abides on you. Some will awake to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Contempt that lasts forever. Now there, there are a couple of other ways that you can show that people are not annihilated in hell. But I think are, are not as strong arguments against the doctrine of uh, annihilation. But one is uh, the rich man in Luke 16. Because it says here, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So we can see here in Luke 16 that the rich man is not being annihilated, right? He's not burning up in hell. But then somebody might say, you know, I, the reason why I'm saying this is maybe a weaker argument, because somebody might say, well, he's in the center of the earth right now, so he's not burning up in the center of the earth, but the you, annihilation only happens when you're cast into the lake of fire. And that's why I refer to that Revelation verse, where Revelation shows that the beast and the false prophet are being tormented day and night, forever and ever, eternal. And also Matthew 25, where it's an everlasting punishment at that last judgment day, where he divides the sheep and the goats and they depart into everlasting punishment. And the other as well is uh, 2 Thessalonians 1. <coughs> Where the Bible says here, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So the reason why, you know, I don't know whether this is a strong verse against annihilation because they'll just say that the everlasting destruction is not everlasting punishment, but it's just that you're destroyed forever. And that's why it's the destruction that is everlasting and not the torment that is everlasting. But I believe that that can be taken both ways. So this, I believe this is another verse that teaches an everlasting hell. But the reason why I just say that it's a weaker verse is because I think that, that people have a, an answer for this, that, that it's not as clear as the other verses. But when we, when we put them all together, we can see that hell is an eternal place. So hell is an eternal punishment. It's not a temporary chastisement. All right, number four. Number four is, and we'll just turn to Genesis 18. That an eternal hell is a fair punishment for sin. And this is something like even myself I struggle with, you know, to think how, how can a, a, such a terrible place exist? And how can, how can telling a lie be worthy of an eternal punishment in hell? But then you've got to think when we have that perspective, we're thinking of hell and we're thinking, we're building doctrine the wrong way. Because when, when we think of something that way and we say, but how can hell be fair? How can an eternal punishment be fair? What we're doing is we in our mind have set an arbitrary level of judgment, haven't we? Like we, we've decided on what is fair, whatever that is in your mind. You've decided on what is fair and what isn't fair. And then you're comparing that to hell and thinking, wow, that's a lot more harsh than what I would do. That's a lot more harsh than what I think is fair. But is that how we're meant to build doctrine? That's not how we're meant to build doctrine. We're not meant to start with our own ideas and our own judgments and then judge God's word based on our own judgments. We're meant to start from the word of God and then build our thinking that way. So the underlying assumption when somebody says, well, hell is not really fair for even one lie. Well, they, the underlying assumption there is they have set an arbitrary bar of judgment. And then they're saying that hell is a lot worse than what they've set. But they are not God, so they don't decide. So... We can't just create a standard apart from the Word of God to judge what is and isn't fair. Um, you know, we need to start from the Word of God and then build our thinking that way. So when we look at Genesis 18, right, and we'll just read here from... Uh, I won't read it all for the sake of time, but you remember this story in Genesis 18 where um, the Lord Jesus Christ... Kevin sort of read through this um, last week... Where the, where the Lord Jesus Christ and the two angels come and, and speak to Abraham and say that they're going to go to, to destroy Sodom. And then Abraham is sort of like, you know, like uh, uh, going back and forth with God to try and uh, uh, save the righteous people in, in, in Sodom. But I just wanted to show you this verse in verse 25, where, where Abraham makes this statement. It says, That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked. And that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the, earth said, and the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all that place for their sakes. And then you go on and go on and go forth. And then, um, you know, look at the last one, verse 32. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. Now, a couple of points that I just want to bring out here is, you know, it's almost like Abraham had that same thought. He thought that, you know, it, it's too harsh, like what God is doing. And he, he almost, his question comes across like he's questioning the, the righteous judgment of God, isn't he? Because he's saying like, well, you're going to destroy Sodom? For, for all the things that they're doing? What, what about all the righteous people? Should, he says, shall not the judge of all the, all the earth do right? And, and when we question the fairness of hell, we're sort of asking that same question. We're doubting the righteousness of God and saying, God, like, won't you do right? How, how can this be the right thing to do to punish everybody in hell? But we see here in this story as well that it was the right thing to do because obviously because God did it, first of all. We have no right to question God's justice is his righteous judgment but we see here as well that god would not have destroyed sodom if there were 50 if there were 40 or 30 and all the way to 10 he would not have destroyed that city 
So what did he do in the end when he destroyed Sodom? He took out the righteous people. He took out the people that should not have been destroyed and then he destroyed. So what does that tell me about hell? That means that everybody that goes to hell deserves to be in hell, right? Because if they didn't deserve to be in hell, they wouldn't be in hell, right? And if they shouldn't be in hell, God wouldn't have kept them in hell, right? Because if they're saved and they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they wouldn't be in hell. So the fact that they are there, that's where they should be. Just like in this example of Sodom and Gomorrah, God will do what's right and he will do what's right with hell as well. And anyone that goes to hell and is punished in hell is there because he rightly deserves to be there. Deuteronomy 4. Reading from verse 5, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. And look at this. For what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them, as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And look at this. And what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? So what is Deuteronomy saying here? It's saying that the laws and judgments of God are righteous and to the point where other nations will look at the laws and judgments of God and say, what, what, you know, what, uh, it says, what nation is there so great that hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law. So the thing I wanted to point out here is not only are the laws of God righteous, but the judgments of God are righteous. So when God makes a judgment, when he says the wages of sin is death, and we have eternal death, we have the second death, that is a righteous judgment. So we have to start from that point of view and realize, instead of thinking, how can hell line up with sin? We need to look at the punishment, realize that that's a righteous punishment, and then realize how bad sin is. So instead of thinking, well, my sin's not that bad, why does it, why does it um, deserve such a, an enormous punishment? We should be thinking of it the other way around and realizing, wait, God's judgments are righteous. God always does the right thing. If he has assigned eternal damnation and torment to sin, maybe I'm not looking at sin the right way. You know what I mean? So instead of, instead of thinking I'm looking at hell the wrong way, look at hell the right way and then get a right understanding of sin. Because people, um, uh, somebody asked me, I can't remember who, but somebody asked me, what do I think of the death penalty? Right? And I think, is, is, that, is that harsh? And I'm like, no, I don't think it's harsh. Because if God gave the death penalty, then it's a righteous judgment. That means that's the right thing to do for that scenario. So even in the old covenant, where some laws that we can't break anymore, like the Sabbath, you know, the man was stoned for picking up sticks on the Sabbath. And he, and he was killed for it. Do I think that that was a harsh, a harsh punishment? No. Because he shouldn't have done it. And if God said that the congregation should stone him with stones for doing that, that was a righteous judgment. That was what he deserved for breaking that, for that law. So I don't think God is harsh in the Old Testament where he has corporal, uh, corporal punishment. No, uh, capital punishment. Because God's judgments are righteous. Revelation 16. Look at what the Bible says here. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. But you got to, you know, you got to ask the question though, well, why, why eternal? Like, why does, why does hell have to be eternal? Why can't it just be a really long time? Um, and I thought about it for a second, like, why, why, why an eternal punishment rather than, you know, punishment that is for like millions and millions of years? And I think the reason why, you know, God, you know, I don't know what God, God's thought was behind this, but I think one thing that an eternal punishment does 
is it removes all hope. You know, because if you have a punishment that lasts a really long time, there's always that hope that one day it's going to finish, right? But then if hell is eternal, it's almost like God is saying, you know, you didn't want to put your trust in me. You didn't want to, you didn't want to put your hope in me. So now you're punished with something where, you, where all hope is removed completely. And I think that's, the, the, you know, because if, if all hope is removed, that it ultimately will destroy pride. Because the proudest person that did not want anything to do with God, did not want to put their trust on God, will, ne will now not even have anything to put their trust on. They can't even trust in their riches. They can't trust in, their, in, in anything else, in their other false religions. They, they can't even put their trust in God. And that's, you know, that's why hell is just a terrible place because you can't hope in anything. That there's all, all hope is even gone, um, let alone the punishment itself. All right, let's go on to the next point. So it, an eternal hell is a, a fair punishment for sin. And just another two uh, last quick points. Number five is hell is not separation from God. And I kind of already mentioned that, but I just wanted to show you a couple of verses. Um, in Revelation 14, verse 9, because you'll read this on a lot of gospel tracts where people will say, oh, you know, you'll be eternally separated from God. Hell is separation from God. And they'll say that's what makes hell so bad because God is not there. But that's not what makes hell so bad. What makes hell so bad is not that God is not there and there's just this burning and longing for God's love that you can't, can't get anymore. The reason why hell is so hot and hell is so bad is because God is there. And you're there in the presence of God as a sinner, not saved by the grace of God. Um, look at what it says here in Re Revelation 14. It says, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his right or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, his hatred, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Look at this. In the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image. And whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So we see here the people that take the mark of the beast. And again, these are men, right? So hell is not total annihilation because these people are being tormented day and night forever and ever. So their, their torment will continue in the lake of fire. Um, and it says here that they're tormented in the presence of the holy angels, verse 10 and in the presence of the Lamb. So it's not that they're apart from God, that they're separated from God. They're being tormented in His presence. Let's just go back to uh, first Thess uh, Second Thessalonians 1 real quick as well. And we read this just then, but it says here in verse 9, "...who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power." Note here, it doesn't say away from the presence of the Lord and away from the glory of his power, which is a lot of what a lot of people think that's what it says. It says, no, the everlasting destruction comes from the presence of God and from the glory of his power. It's the fact that you are in his presence and in his glory as a sinner that you are burning in hell. Psalm 139. Look at what the Bible says here. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy, thy presence? Whither is to where? So to where shall I go from thy spirit? Or to where shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. And look at this. And if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. See, God is everywhere. You can't escape God. You don't go to hell and you're separated from God. You're in hell with God, being tormented by God, and that's a pun your punishment for your sin and for rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ, rejecting the Saviour. So Psalm 139 is very clear that you can't flee from God's presence. Where are you going to go to fl flee from God? You go into heaven, He's there, and if you go to hell, He's there as well. So hell is not separation from God. So hell is a literal place of fire. Hell is God's righteous judgment, not Satan's headquarters. Hell is an eternal punishment, not a temporary chastisement. An eternal hell is a fair punishment for sin. 
Hell is not separation from God. And the last one I've got here, um, I just wanted to um, mention briefly the lake of fire. Because remember we talked about hell being in the center of the earth. But then we see here in Revelation 20, it says here, you know, the sea, verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So we see here the final judgment that hell is delivering up everyone to that last white throne judgment. And look at it, it says here in verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And you know, people ask the question, well, is the lake of fire somewhere different to hell? Well, the location is different, right? Because hell right now is in the center of the earth and the lake of fire is in outer darkness. They are cast into the lake of fire after they are taken out of hell. So is it wrong then to say that you go to hell for all eternity? Well, it's not because I want to show you in the Bible that the lake of fire is also referred to as hell. So basically, the way I like to think of it is the lake of fire is like hell hell relocated so hell is basically cast into the lake of fire and relocated and then people are cast into the lake of fire where hell now is which is the lake of fire so the beast and the false prophet and satan are cast into the lake of fire first then hell is relocated and then everybody is now at the lake of fire which is also called hell and i just want to show you this in the bible because in matthew 10 <coughs> We read here, the Bible says here, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. See, when a person dies right now, their soul will go to hell if they're an unbeliever. But their body doesn't go to hell, right? Their body is, we bury the body. The body's lying on the ground and goes in a grave, and we bury it and have the ceremony. Remember we read in Daniel, some will ra be raised up to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So there will be a resurrection at the last day of the white throne judgment where death and hell deliver up the dead which are in them and everyone is reunited with their body. And then from there they are cast into the lake of fire, remember? So we see here that God is going to destroy both soul and body in hell. So in Matthew 10, 28, we see that the lake of fire is also referred to as hell. It's because hell has been relocated to the lake of fire and can still be rightly called hell. So it's not wrong to say that we'll, somebody can, will burn in, in hell for all eternity because that's true, because the lake of fire is also referred to as hell. And the last verse I just want to take you to, which also supports this point, is uh, in Matthew and we read this in Mark. I just wanted to turn to a different, um, a different passage that says the same thing. But in Matthew 5, we have again this warning to um, do whatever it takes to not go to hell. Jesus says here, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So again, two times where the Bible is showing us here that the whole body is going to be cast into hell. Now, if hell was only that place in the center of the earth, the body never goes to that place, right? Because that's where the souls go to burn in hell in Luke 16. Then when the soul is reunited with the body, the body is then destroyed, both soul and body in hell, and also here in Matthew 5, we see here that it's profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So again, we see here there the body being cast into hell, showing us that the lake of fire is also referred to as hell. So I hope that gives you a bit of understanding of the difference between the lake of fire and hell. So there's, some, there's six truths about hell. Um, I've got some more, but... I'll continue that next week.